aloha and welcome to Talk Story with John Waihe'e. And what can I say? Today we have a super show. I look forward every year or, or a couple of years to this particular show because we get to play with the pundits of political wisdom in the state of Hawaii and, and, and like really drain their intellect. And today our guests are we have um, Colin Moore and welcome here. Colin professor are Great you what do here governor yeah I, what directorship are you holding at the current time by the way I, I, I'm I, the, never... the director of the UH public policy center okay the UH public policy center see now, now with that title alone you get an invitation to this show <laughs> And your friend in the corner, Mr. Chad Moore from Civil B. Who, who doesn't look anxiously forward to receiving that newspaper that you put, you know. Thank you, by the way. Thank you, by Thank the you. way, for doing uh, that the real public service for all of us. They have some kind of intelligent, intelligent uh, news reporting uh, that you can read. So Thanks. from Civil Beats, Colin Moore, and boy, are we going to take advantage of his presence. And of course, of course, the guy who every single day reminds us why our president needs to be fired. We have with us Jay Fidel. How are you, Jay? I'm good. Thank you, Governor. I, I, I look forward to that, you know, that half an hour when you talk about why uh, Donald Trump needs to be, um, uh, you know, fired or, or whatever happens to former presidents. Hey, by the way, uh, all of you who've been watching, uh, Clinton came out with a great line tonight. He said something about if you vote for Trump, you know, it'll be uh, the three Bs, blame, bully, and belittle. And if you vote for Biden, it would be Bill, the blah, 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 blah. But, uh, Anyway, I want to start off by talking about the recent uh, primary election in the state of Hawaii. And so I was watching you, Colin, on TV the night of the election. What, you know, tell, just in general, tell us about what your, what your feelings were. I mean, what do you think, uh, what do you think that election was all about? I think the, the big story from the election was voter turnout. We had over 400,000 people cast ballots. So that's about 150,000 more than in the 2016 primary. Um, and so depending on how you calculate it, that's that's around a 16 percentage point increase in turnout, which is a remarkable thing. I mean, we're notorious for having the lowest voter turnout in the nation. Um, and, and this really was unexpected. I mean, I had predicted a, a slight bump in turnout um, with our move to all mail and ballots, but but this was remarkable. I mean, even the 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 most um, generous estimates, papers that have been done about Colorado when it switched to all mail and voting, um, only got about nine percentage points. Um, and other states have have been even lower. Um, so so this was unexpected, and of course it was uneven throughout the state. Some precincts were higher, some were lower, and there's a great story in Civil Beat. Um, uh, that, that where you can actually play around with some of that data. But even if you look at the, the districts where you have the, still the lowest turnout, which is Central and West Maui and Kalihi, it's still eight to nine percentage points, all the way up to an increase in turnout of over 20 percentage points in, in Mililani. So, so this is remarkable. We, we didn't really think this would ever turn around. Um, you know, there's a few things that could happen. Um, but I'm pretty optimistic that a lot of these voters are going to stay voters for the general election. Maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, later in the show uh, why why that happened. I'm sure Chad and Jay and you, Governor, have some theories. Um, well, you know, the um, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, no, I, no, I no. Thought, uh, well, as a segue, you know, let's get over to Chad. Chad, what what do you think about what uh, Colin was just saying? I mean, what was Civil Beat's analysis of the uh, election turnout? Um, I, I certainly agree with Colin that the uh, voter registration, the mail-in uh, numbers were impressive, but I, I, I do want to put a caveat on that. Remember 400,000, 407,000, I think was the turnout, 
but that's out of a total of nearly 800,000 registered voters. In other words, you know, about half. <laughs> and then right. on top of that, the state's 1.4 million people, although not everybody is of age eligible and not everybody is from here. So I still feel like we have a long ways to go. My other main takeaway, and we can talk about this later, is not only how COVID changed the campaign, but how mail-in balloting is going to just change fundamentally how we do elections. When do you hold a debate? Uh, should you hold a debate? When do you go in the field to run polls? Uh, when should you stop polling? And remember that those ballots were going out as early as, what, July 15th or so? I think they were actually ahead of schedule by a couple of days. The primary wasn't until August 8th. And we were counting ballots uh, every other day. The elections office was giving us updates on how many had come in. So if you're a politician and governor, you of all people are the only one right. this Zoom has run before. But this, I mean, when do you stop sign waving? Uh, when, you know, do, when do you peak? When do you peak? Which, when uh, you do know, you peak? Exactly. Yeah. Because there were campaigns running television commercials. And as we all know, that's not cheap. Right up until Friday, April the 7th. And... Uh, Boy, is, is that, uh, there were even attacks going on, particularly between the Hanabusa and Amamiya campaign over this and that, all in the last week of the election. How much did that really change the outcome? And, uh, and how do you poll? I mean, where do you know? You know, we used to run these uh, running polls going up to the time when people could start voting. And, uh, and you had a specific date. Now, now there's like a two week period, I guess, when people are voting. I mean, they're yeah. actually there. Yeah. Uh, Jay, you got any thoughts about uh, all of this and what that means for Hawaii politics? Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's is an extension of the national interest. Um, I think, um, you know, people like me, I take it out of my own experience. I'm sure your experiences are similar. I'm spending more time at home now. Um, and I'm catching MSNBC and uh, CNN. I, I'm sorry, but I do not watch Fox News. I have a rule about Fox News. I watch it until the first lie. Uh, and I, I haven't gotten past 15 seconds just yet. <laughs> in any way, in any way, so, you know, I think people are fascinated. They're watching television. They're watching all this news about voting. They're seeing Trump, you know, try to delay the election, the national election. Uh, and, and otherwise undermine their right to vote. So a lot of talk about voting in the Constitution. Um, and, and I think there's a sort of a, 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 a rising of, of public concern everywhere, including Hawaii, um, about you know, the loss of our constitutional rights and our democracy, all that stuff that's been building up for a long time. So all of a sudden voting takes on a greater meaning. Now, you know, customarily for primaries, Hawaii hasn't been too excited. As a matter of fact, for elections in general, Hawaii hasn't been too excited. Um, but I think, you know, if there's- yeah, I mean, how excited do you get in a one party state? You know, I mean, yeah. in the primary, it's true. It's true. you it's know, true. what uh, it's almost, it was almost, the other side of the story is the fact that there were a, a number of elections that were actually meaningful. There, there was a, a, some incumbents getting challenged and, um, you know, maybe we can chat a little bit about that. I mean, is there a progressive movement starting in Hawaii? Is, is something happening here within the Democratic Party, if not from the Republican Party? What do you, uh, you want to take a crack at it, Colin? Sure. I mean, you know, the, the most remarkable legislative race really was the, the Kim Koko Iwamoto challenge to suck Scott Psyche downtown. And a lot of people, including me, I mean, Kim Koko Iwamoto is a strong campaigner. She's well known. She's a good fundraiser. She works hard. Everyone expected her to do okay, but I don't think anyone expected her to come as close as she did to uh, beating the Speaker of the House in his own district, which, as far as I know, I mean, it is really almost unheard of. Um, and I mean, because the Speaker commands a lot of resources, he, Scott Psyche, poured a bunch of money into this campaign defensively, something he hasn't had to do in a long time. I don't think he's right. even had a challenger um, recently. So, so this, I mean, part of this may have been that the, the Kaka'ako district has a lot of new people moving in, not necessarily loyal to the incumbent, but this is something you don't see very often. And Kim Koko Iwamoto ran from the left. I mean, she is a dyed in the wool progressive. Um, and you saw a couple of other maybe surprising victories over incumbents from people who uh, are, 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 are very much uh, progressive. Um, you know, I think of Adrian Tam, 
uh, beating Tom Brower in Waikiki. I mean, Tom Brower, I don't think, maybe some people thought he was a weak incumbent, but I mean, there wasn't any indication really that that his seat was in danger until the end. I mean, until you saw, uh, you know, some of the, the money from the speaker's pack start um, moving into that race to, to defend some of the incumbents. So I think, I think we've been waiting for this for a long time. And I think one thing I expect to see from this is, you know, nothing succeeds like success. So more of these younger progressives, they're gonna have an easier time fundraising because some of them have one. Um, and I think it's going to encourage them to challenge some of the, the centrist progressives who, you know, now are sort of um, described on guys. Twitter and social media as, as conservatives. Yeah, I, well, you know, okay, Chad, what makes a progressive a progressive? I mean, why are these young people progressive as opposed to uh, the people that are already there that, uh, for the most part, take the same position on issues? I mean, what, what are yeah. the... Uh, what are the, yeah, the dividing line between the new progressive and the guys who are there? The things that I heard, and remember, Kim Coco Iwamoto is, is no spring chicken. I mean, she's been, she was right. elected to the Board of Education years ago. She's run for lieutenant governor. She's run for the state senate. Uh, but I agree with Colin. That was quite a shock. It was 162 votes that separated what Psyche had and what Iwamoto had. That's remarkably close. But what I heard coming from Folks like Iwamoto and people like Gary Hooser, uh, the former Kauai senator who was very strongly backing her campaign, was dissatisfaction with the status quo uh, at the House. And for Scott Psyche, that had to be a bit of a surprise. Remember, back in the day, he was a dissenter. He was right. against uh, Calvin Say and, and even Joe Suki. And then, of course, they formed a coalition with Suki. And then Scott Psyche became speaker. Uh, and if you think about it, what I heard mostly was things like minimum wage. How come you're not raising the minimum wage? Well, I'm not going to go into the arguments, but I heard that over and over again. It's still $10.10. We did not increase it this year. Obviously, COVID came to town. Another thing I heard was affordable housing over and over again. But having said that, under Scott Psyche, you've had uh, medical aid in dying, um, You've had dispensaries for marijuana, and of course this includes the Senate and, and their progress as well. Decriminalization of small amounts of marijuana. So how do you define progressive? And I think for Psyche, who felt like they had made some progress, that was really a shock to see that he was still so targeted as somehow being not progressive. Yeah, not progressive. And uh, Jay, you know, you've, um, you've known Walter Ritty for a long time. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> I think he's even been on your show, uh, if I'm correct. And, so. and, 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 and so were, were you at all surprised that he, he almost uh, got elected to the House of Representatives? I mean, the Molokai race. Yeah, we're, we're, what are your we're thoughts fine, about aren't it? We, that Walter would run and show so well? Uh, Walter is um, different than really any other candidate. I mean, he's been a super activist. Uh, yeah, he doesn't only uh, listen to a different drummer, he listens to different bongos. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's so, true. So, tell us a, why, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, think, uh, I think we're moving into a more progressive uh, era now. Um, we had a show with um, Kim Coco last week and I was really impressed. You know, you guys have interviewed people, you've all interviewed people. Uh, but the mark of a, of a good interviewee is they answer your questions. You know, right. Many people do not answer your questions. Uh, she answered every one of my questions spot on, immediately and candidly and honestly with, with feeling. Um, she was describing her position on things, her platform. And boy, there was so much heart in there. I said to myself, this is like irresistible. In the end, I think she represents the new generation coming up. There'll be more like her. Uh, why? Why? You, try, you why? fail, you try, you fail, and then one day you win. No, but why? Was, why is she representative, representative of the new generation? I, I'm trying to get she's this. She's not satisfied, John, and and I think part of part of the, the 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 wave that you guys are talking about is what happened in the legislature this year, uh, and I and I, I think that's relevant to this discussion because people who watch the legislature, in fact, who run for it. Um, they're not satisfied with the way it works. Yeah, there may have been some interesting, you know, progressive bills over the past few years, but, but to um, the, the generation coming up, it's not enough. We have to remake the state. And uh, that this session, we, have, we didn't go one inch really. 
we have a long way to go before we remake the state. I'd be interested in, in how. Well, it, is that more, that. Uh, Jay, you know, is that more a question and, and for anybody actually, more a question of process or policy? How much of what we're calling this group, the, this new progressive uh, politician, how much of what they stand for is about process or is it really about a difference in policy? I think it's actually both. I mean, it's policy to, to take on new, new issues, new initiatives, but it's also a dissatisfaction with the way things work as a, as a procedural matter. You know, what is with the conference committee? How come the chairs rule, rule the whole um, you know, yeah. process of the committees? Um, there are so many things that happen in the legislature that are discouraging. And uh, it's gonna be hard to fix that. It's gonna be hard to change that. Um, but if I were running for office, I would, I would make that part of my platform. And I think a lot of, a lot of people, and I know that's risky politically, um, but I think you know, coming up, we're gonna see more people who question both of those things. Yeah, what, do you, what do you think, uh, Chad, Colin? What do you, you, do you really see a difference with the, uh, the politics of the future in Hawaii or is this you more know, about form? Yeah. Or, or I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little cautious to, to embrace, to, to say that there's this blanket change coming. There were some people that got in that I think it was definitely generational. Sonny Gennad and Gennadin, I'm probably pronouncing his, and I know Sonny, but he beat Romy Cachola by an enormous margin. And remember, that was a rematch from two years ago. And how should I put this mildly? There have been some suspicions about how votes are counted in that Kalihi district over the years regarding a representative Cachola. But in that regard, I think you really do see someone coming along at a different age, who's an activist, who's an attorney uh, in a very working class uh, neighborhood. And folks like that, I think do represent a change. But having watched the legislature over the years, a few people get in and it's amazing how many Governor, you were in the legislature. Right. How many? How many? That guy represented the same district that Romy Cachola lost. No kidding. <laughs> he's, okay. a, yeah. he's a success. He's, 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 he's my uh, successor. Okay. In the, yeah. How many, I haven't always how many, been happy with him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many get roped in to the the status quo? And that's why Jay, things like conference committee, which really is a way of of killing bills, so nobody has any fingerprints on them, really working out deals behind closed doors, gut and replace, which has its pros and cons, but when it's done negatively, you really are blindsiding the public in terms of disclosure of when a bill is being heard and when they can testify. I do think there needs to be some change there. There's a lawsuit before the Supreme Court regarding gut and place right now, uh, but it, it takes a groundswell. It takes more than a few people to get in. I'll just give you one other example. I know Colin wants to add something. Think about when AOC got in uh, to the house and everyone talked about this new wave of young progressives. Remember the four women right. that Trump kept targeting? Nancy Pelosi runs that house and she's almost 80 years old. Yeah, well, you know, uh, go ahead, uh, Colin. Well, you, got the... you know, I think your question about policy and process is, is a really interesting one. And I, I mean, I, I talk to my students about this all the time who, you know, love to say uh, critical things about uh, the ledge and, and uh, incumbents. And so I, th you know, I, I expect that many of these young progressives who, who get in, I mean, will, I don't want to say co-opted. I think there's just a certain logic uh, to, you want to get something done, you got to play ball. These are the rules you want to deliver for your district. Um, and so you, you, you know, you end up um, uh, uh, looking more establishment. I think, I think some of it's just generational frustration. Um, I think that they're, you know, just like on the mainland, if you look at the median age of the members of the legislature, it's it's pretty old. Um, and I think right. there's just a sense that these people are out of touch, even though many of them, you know, on paper are, are pretty progressive, or at least they're sort of old fashioned New Deal union progressives, um, you know, in, in, in some ways. I mean, they're not, there's not a lot of conservatives in our legislature, um, you know, even people who would be sort of considered center uh, center right by mainland standards, but I think that's motivating it somewhat too. Um, you know, there just has been here in Hawaii too, I think recently um, around uh, Native Hawaiian activism around Mauna Kea, um, now in the mainland, Black Lives Matter, this just fierce opposition 
um, to President Trump. It's just politicized uh, younger people who um, I think feel like they, they want to run for office. I mean, the, the last wave we really had of, of a, a new generation of, of, of younger people coming in really was around the time that, that, that you entered politics, you know, Governor Abercrombie entered politics. I mean, a whole group of people, many of whom um, you know, until pretty recently, we're, we're still we're still active. In well, politics. this is so uh, just for, be a generational change. For a long time, th there were no new 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 uh, generations of, of rebellion. You know, in in the Hawaii politics, because uh, I mean, the, I I don't know, and I, I saw that that evening some very interesting races. I know Gary Hoosier has been out there with his uh, Progressive Academy and has done a good job with getting uh, young people excited about it and so forth. And, but I don't know whether or not some of these little lights of interest uh, are uh, may, taking over the, the story. I mean, making us see it, all of the, these happenings as, uh, as, a, as a big story when 80% of the, approximately 80%, this is a rough number, 80% of the incumbents just got reelected without <laughs> any opposition essentially and you got a you got a, a, i'm you know i have to confess i'm one of uh, kai kahele's uh <laughs> coach uh right. campaign chairman and all of that stuff but you, you got a person that's going to be going to the united states congress with essentially no opposition and so where is the big change you know where is the big to me the biggest change was maybe the old guy who realized that the change had to be inside the system was Walter. He, he actually went out and campaigned, you know. He did something, and he was running against, I think the only difference between him and the, his opponent was that he might have been stronger in the GMO issue, which is a substantive difference to, 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 to come in and, and to say that. But I, I, in terms of the issues, I think the only candidate that I actually heard articulate was uh, Kim Coco uh, Iwamoto. She, she actually had it together. She had a package of very progressive ideas that, that would really, uh, you know, went beyond just conference committees and the rest. I mean, the other side of the coin is if you really want change to happen, get a bunch of people that actually want to do something different and use the current system. It's John, really good for shove course. things through. Discussion. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, and Sybil B covered this a couple of times, uh, and it's this uh, remarkable um, PAC and super PAC contribution to various campaigns, including, including funding from mainland organizations um, that for some reason have an interest in the outcome of some of these races. And it strikes me, I, Chad, you're gonna know more about this, but um, it strikes me that there's more money coming in uh, from PACs and super PACs and people who you really wonder why are making these large contributions than there were before. Um, and um, I'm, I'm just wondering how this skews the result because the truth is the more money you put into a campaign, the better you're gonna do that. I'm sorry, that's the American way. Um, so, so query, what, what is happening here? Well, I think the main pack that we know about is that uh, Aloha Aina, I forget the last full, last word of that particular pack. It's not the same as the Aloha Aina party though, but this is the pack that basically supported Colleen Hanabusa. Although as a super pack, you can't have any formal ties with the campaign or the candidate, but they were clearly trying to take down Keith Amamiya and the person whose name was on that pack, at least publicly, acknowledged that he was a Hanabusa supporter, although sort of poo-pooed whether or not that was influencing whether, you know, his own vote or his own activity. But Amamiya actually won. And it, to me, sometimes I wonder whether that kind of stuff backfires. The ads they were running, the, the flyer that was being circulated, the mailer, wasn't that good it was in terms of if, if you're going to do negative politics you got to take it up a notch stylistically amateur and, uh, hour yeah yeah, yeah and, 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 <laughs> and it might don't you think it might have been too negative i mean it was I, I like do. too I, raw it, there was no subtlety to it i mean oh. by the last week they were trying to somehow paint keith amamiya as being the same as roy amamiya their cousins and of course roy is 
received a subject letter because of the FBI investigation into the Kale Ohan and so forth. But I mean, what kind of smear is that? I mean, I just, uh, I mean, there's, there's questions to be raised about who Keith Amamiya knows and who he's received money from. But that's a bit of a stress to say, and you're related to somebody the FBI is looking into. And I think it just back and, Han and Hanabusa, any, for any candidate, whoever they receive money from, it's going to be an important issue. But don't you think that given the all mail-in ballots and given the COVID situation, um, in fact, that brings up a good point, Jay. Does it look or at least intuitively suggest that money is much more important today when you can't go house to house and shake everybody's hand, you can't do rallies, you can't do the kind of stuff that we used to have to do when I had no money and I was running. I mean, what else? I don't I know. Think, I think absolutely. I think money has made a, a difference in this environment because like you, you said, you can't, you can't do that old fashioned shoe leather politics that easily it's all ads you're running or, I mean, a lot of it is ads on social media. I mean, and some of the candidates, Amami in particular, raised a lot of money and had a really good presence there. Um, although I don't think it's determinative. I mean, you have, you can see examples in this last election where the people who spent the most money didn't win. I'm thinking of that Windward Council District um, where Teixeira spent the most money, but Esther Kiaina uh, came in first and I think of the three top finishers, she spent the least. Um, you know, the other example I'd give here um, is uh, um, Ikaika Marzo, who came in second on the Big Island race. I mean, of course, Harry Kim famously doesn't campaign, but you know, in that case, I think some of these challengers who like like Ikaika Marzo, who already had a huge social media presence because of his, you know, becoming a bit of a folk hero around the eruption in 2018, you know, that was already in place and you could draw on that. And, you know, if you had that, maybe you didn't need a ton of money because you, you, you started out from this big advantage already having that infrastructure. Well, this is something, you know, I, I, I don't know how much of our thinking, uh, we, we might be seeing a, an entirely new world. And, and some of it, actually, it's interesting to see how much of it comes out of the U.S. continent and how much of it is sort of homegrown, uh, what's ever happening here. Now, uh, last night, Michelle Obama uh, was uh, the, the keynote speaker at the Democratic, the last speaker, the Democratic uh, convention, virtual convention that's going on as, as we talk. And she, she gave a speech that even Fox News, your favorite um, uh, station, <laughs> Jay, uh, which, which even Fox News was, uh, you know, not, I wouldn't say complimentary, but, well, maybe the word might be complimentary, but they were talking about how effective it was and, and how good it was. And so we, at this time, are going to take a one minute break. When we come back, I want to pivot and, uh, uh, and talk a little bit about the, the, national, uh, the national scene and what's happening and why would, uh, uh, you know, why uh, Fox News may be actually a little afraid of Michelle Obama. I, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to take a break right now, guys. Aloha. I'm Christine Linders, a physical therapy specialist and the host of Movement Matters. My show is designed to teach you the simplest and most effective treatment strategies to get you out of pain and back to doing what you love. If you or someone you know is having pain in a certain area of the body and would like a free assessment in treatment over media or in person, and then come on the show to talk about it, email us at thinktechmovementmatters at gmail.com. Or if you have a topic you would like to know more about, please email us. My goal is to decrease pain all over the world, inspiring people to take better care of their bodies, to enjoy life to the fullest. I look forward to hearing from you.
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe'e and Hawaii, Premier Political Pundit. So we left the, um, we left the last segment of the, uh, the session talking a little bit about Michelle Obama. And uh, I'm assuming that at least one of you got to see her last night. So maybe Chet, if you saw Michelle, what, what do you think of her uh, presentation? She knocked it out of the park. It was a remarkable speech, as best of an indictment of the Trump administration as I, I think you could possibly make. And as you probably know by now, she was wearing this little necklace that had V-O-T-E, vote, right? And apparently that's gone viral. People are picking up on that. I think by the reaction of the president to the speech alone tells you how effective he basically tried to dismiss it and say, what did she say? No big deal. But even Chris Wallace over there at Fox News, who's not anywhere like Sean Hannity or, or um, Tucker Carlson and so forth. He's, he's much more level headed. He's a reporter. And I think he keeps his biases in check. So she just, what was the term that she used to describe? He, she, he sliced and diced the president? Yeah, that, she said he, that he was, he <laughs> sliced and diced the, the and, president. And his blade or something like that. And it was really that good of a speech. Um, and I think the bar is really high uh, for not only the rest of the week, but, uh, for Joe Biden in particular, but also next week for the president and and uh, Mike Pence. Well, yeah, and, and for anybody else that's speaking, um, Chad, have, uh, Colin, have you watched any of the uh, convention at all? Or? Not enough. I've just seen the highlights um, because we're, we're desperately trying to get ready for the semester. So I need to go back. And, <laughs> I need to Is go there back news? I mean, can you, make an, a, can you make an announcement about the semester uh, year or is that something that some other programs can do? Sure. We're, 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 semester's happening and we're almost exclusively online, but it's going to be, it'll be fun. I'm teaching my campaigns and elections class this semester. So maybe I can get one of you guys to to join me on a Zoom call to answer student questions. And maybe you can identify what a Hawaii progressive looks like. Right, I'll <laughs> ask the students. They should know, They're, you have 60 young progressives in the class. <laughs> well, you know, one of the interesting things, and this is one of the worries uh, as we watch the, co the convention unfold, and that is that the Democrats, uh, and this was brought up, I, I, uh, Democrats have a way of um, killing each other off. And uh, what do you think will happen? I mean, it was interesting. Right this afternoon, I, I got, as we're talking about the great Joe Biden and why we've got to do something about the, um, about uh, unelecting Trump and the rest of it, I get an uh, email saying, whoa, the revolution is still on at the convention. We're getting all of these things passed and we're going to do this and we're going to change that and we're going to take over. And we are not giving up fighting corporate Democrats. So what do you think? I mean, will that, what kind of an impact will that have? I think that overall, I mean, there's, there's always a sort of some, the radical left, which um, I think is, is never going to support um, Biden or Harris, but the vast majority of these people, I think, because of uh, their fury about Trump and, uh, and the laser-like focus on defeating him, I'll like, I think a lot of those conversations have been bracketed, but you can expect them to come back. If Biden and Harris win, you know, two centrist corporate Democrats, um, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure. And you're seeing what, you know, on the left, for Democrats, you're seeing what happened on the right years ago, where people are getting primaried. I mean, they're established Democrats are losing their seat um, by challenges from the left, as often happened, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s from um, you know, the, Republican the Tea party. party from the right. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting to me, but uh, I, I think that the, the, the Trump response the Republican response to the Democratic strategy to beat Trump is to try and exploit that division. I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, well, you know, does this really mean that or does this really mean this? And I don't know. Uh, Jay, you got any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've seen a couple of articles in the last couple of days about how um, there are divisions within the Democratic Party. Yeah, they may not be serious, but they're there. Uh, frankly, it's a bad time to have divisions. You know, if, 
if the more progressives uh, want, you know, want to, um, you know, have an argument with Biden, how about after the election, not now? Now is really, and they, they called it this on day one, now is the time for unity. It's so important. And I totally agree, John. Um, Trump sees any, any division there as something that he can exploit, and he will, and he does. Um, and, and then he can twist it. He can say, oh, you know, they want to take really leftist positions on this. They're going to bring the country down, even though there may be a, a minority of people within the Democratic Party that, that feel that way. He can expand that. He can exaggerate that and make it look, you know, worse than it is. So, I mean, if, if I were to advise a whole lot of them and I would say, come on, this is not a time for division. Later, you can have your say, oh, but right now, why don't you, you know, find a common platform? Well, Bernie Sanders uh, said that. And yet, just the other day, um, just the other day, of all people, Barbara Boxer, Barbara Boxer, foreign, uh, you know, Latina senator from California, former senator from California, is on the media talking about the need for uh, uh, Senator Harris to apologize for some of her actions as, as prosecutor. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you do three, three, uh, you know, three months from the election or so. I, I, I'd like to jump in here but with a couple of observations if I could, Governor. You know, the Democrats have always been a divided party. They've always been factionalized from day one. And the Republican Party has its own factions, too, although right now it appears to be all Trump. But remember, six months ago, the betting money was that Bernie Sanders was going to be the Democratic nominee. And he was probably going to pick, I don't know, Elizabeth Warren or someone. I mean, that that's the way it was going to go. And then remember, <laughs> right. he was winning those races early on. Biden finished fourth or fifth. And the old adage about you've either got to win Iowa or New Hampshire, he didn't get either of those two. He did get South Carolina. And I think it was James Clyburn and the African-American community. But he didn't get Nevada, right? I think Bernie got Nevada as well. So I think what happened and it still makes my head spin, COVID came to town and they suddenly they recognize that Biden is gonna to have to be the nominee. And I was impressed with how quickly Biden was supported by Bernie Sanders. Even Tulsi Gabbard came out and, and gave an endorsement. And so I think people are gonna swallow their concerns. Remember Joe and Kamala or Kamala are not progressives really. They're actually fairly yeah. moderate in their positions. And um, I think people, just, the Democratic Party is going to swallow whatever principles they have because they want to get Trump out. But, but well, I'd also, uh, I'd also add, though, that the, um, I, I think the impact from Sanders doing so well um, has been that these ideas, which were, I think, you know, eight years ago would have been dismissed as kind of so much complaining from the far left have become pretty mainstream. And if you look at what Biden is proposing, it's it's pretty progressive stuff. I mean, you know, some of his proposals for education and transit projects and, and things like that, he's, he's certainly moved left to try to capture those progressives. But he's not backing Medicare for all, which True. is arguably the biggest platform for the left. And, and he picked uh, Kamala Harris. And, and the, you know, I don't know uh, how much of that was a concession to, you know, good old fashioned, we got to get to the middle is the vote are the votes that you want to win because the one thing about Camilla is that she's probably was the only candidate that could um, survive, could survive um, the, 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 the criticism about the Black Lives Matter and how that's uh, more about protesting, protesting than about doing anything good for people and blah, 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 blah. You know, all of that, that the right has made, have made to be a, such an issue that this is about, not about racial injustice. This is about destruction and, and the like. And Camilla can come out there and say, you know, I'm for justice. And if somebody, you know, so I don't know. I, how pragmatic was that choice? Anybody. I think it was, I think it was, even though it was, it was foreseen. I mean, she was the number one pick all along. I thought the selection process was done very, very well. The way they would leak out who they were thinking, whether it's Tammy Duckworth today or Val Demings, and then you'd see big stories in the media and so forth. It was, I think, a very careful, considered decision. 
and thus far it's playing like gangbusters. Again, what does Trump do? He turns to birtherism, starts questioning yeah. whether or not she's even qualified to be vice president on, on day two after, after her, her selection. So barring any unexpected thing in her past, and I, she's already been vetted. She ran for senator. She's a former attorney general, a former prosecutor. I've got some concerns with her. She seems to be kind of wishy-washy on her policy and her platform. But boy, I think he picked absolutely the right person for his ticket. And, and he picked a person that could go toe to toe with any any law and order person. I, you know, what is interesting? Uh, I watched today's uh, session of the of the convention, and we had Clinton on, who is a friend, and I've known him for years. I, you know, and he's there speaking and so forth. And it suddenly occurred to me how old we are. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it, it was like, it was interesting. How many years ago when he was running for president and the task that he had, which is so interesting, was to sort of bring the party back to the center, mm -hmm. to move the party back to the center. And I started thinking about it and I, I thought about uh, Ronald Reagan. And actually we talk about Reagan as a... Um, as a conservative, and he's the one of the pillars of American political conservatism. It, 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 but in actuality, in order to when he won the presidency, he actually moved his party a little to the left. You know, he allowed labor unions and the like. Well, he still you know went after the um, uh, the people that controllers at the airports, but he allowed labor to come into his uh into the tent and uh you know, he, go ahead he made the, you're, you're exactly right governor i mean he put a respectable uh face on uh on policies that you know goldwater couldn't sell or, or couldn't or, sell right yeah he, he he made conservatism mainstream mm -hmm. and i think to a certain extent that was uh clinton's clinton's job uh, for the Democratic Party. So there was this movement in both cases, historically, toward the great American middle. You know, the great American middle, which is, as you political scientists teach your children, at least the dream of the 1950s. You know, I, it was this, there, there was this great political middle. And, uh, both, but today, I, it's like, uh, where is the middle? I mean, I, I, you know, you, you know, it seems like the litmus test. There's a, a litmus test for everything. I don't know. But you guys know where the middle is in American politics. What would who would be called the centrists? It's it's hard to find it actually. Uh, you know, we did a survey. Now it, it's it's not a all that broad a survey, but it's a little think tech survey among our. Um, constituents. And um, one of the questions is how, how confident are you of, um, of, of um, Donald Trump? And uh, remarkable that uh, roughly, you got to look at the exact question, but roughly 20% of the people were either confident of him or somewhat confident of him. Here, that's here. So you don't know, you don't know. A lot of the people who support Trump are not telling you. They're quiet about it. They're afraid that if they say this in public, you know, people are going to criticize them. So, I mean, I don't think we're going to know until the election. But let me raise one other thing. And that is, you know, we're talking again, again the dichotomy between substance and process. And, you know, we can talk about where the middle is and we can talk about how people are going to make their analysis and how they're going to be affected by various factors. But at the end of the day, I worry about the process. I worry about the post office. Um, <clears throat> I worry about all the suppression techniques the Republicans have used and continue to use. Um, and I worry that that will have a, a, a significant effect on how the vote comes out on, on the president. Don't you, don't you worry about that? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, Dad, Colin, anything? Yeah, I, you know, remember that Trump did get still about a third, slightly less than a third of the vote in Hawaii uh, against Hillary Clinton. I mean, that's 
there's a lot of people that sympathize, empathize, admire him in this state. And I agree with Jay that there's a lot of people that won't speak up publicly to say how they they really feel about the president, uh, but privately, or I'm sure rooting for him. And the polls have actually tightened a little bit nationally. Uh, it looked like Biden had a pretty decent 11 or 12 point lead. Some of the states are closer, more like five and six, but there has been an ever slight tightening in some cases. And I simply don't rule Trump out at all, particularly given, I mean, the post office is exactly uh, front and center uh, and it's, I mean, say what you will about Donald Trump, but he's got a certain political brilliance to him. I'm not saying I admire it, but I'm saying it has been effective. And I think the race may be closer than we think. Well, um, go, Colin, yeah, what's your I, thought? I agree. It, I mean, it has tightened a little bit um, in, in, in recent days. I mean, one, one thing that's remarkable about this election, though, is how much people think it matters. There's this really telling um, polling question, which basically just asks people, do you think it matters who wins the presidential election? And back in 2000, only about 50% of people thought it really mattered. And now 85% of people do. So I, I, certainly in my life, I can't remember a time when people are so focused on politics. And it would be rare to encounter someone on the street who just says, eh, they're all the same. I don't care. I mean, people have very passionate views about this, which I think is part of the reason uh, we saw even voter turnout in Hawaii go up. Well, well first of all, let, let, we, let, uh, we've got a series of questions. we got about three more minutes left. So first of all, are you, uh, do you believe voter turnout will be up in the entire nation or down? Uh, just up. up. Up, up, up. What do you think, Chad? I agree, but there will be efforts to keep it down. Yes. Yeah, and and you think that uh, do you think now, uh, President Trump, if if he loses, will leave um, like a gentleman, or what are we in for? What do you think the end of this scenario will be? You know, Donald Trump has a number of things that you can see over his career. One of them is go to court. He sues. He sues. He sues. I don't. I think you're going to have to drag him screaming from the Oval Office if he should lose. And if he does lose, what do you, you think that he will all of a sudden lose any kind of immunity? I mean, I think that people will go after. Him. See, when you're winning, Donald is on top. You can be a bully. But when you start to lose, how much of that sticks to you? So I, I don't know. I, there might be a lot of chaos following this. Election. Oh, I, t I totally agree with that. There'll be chaos if, um, you know, maybe this is uh, simplistic, but if, um, if, uh, Trump wins, uh, the liberal part of the country will be in the streets. It'll make yeah. Black Lives Matter look small. Um, and if uh, Trump loses, uh, the skinheads will be in the streets and they'll have Second Amendment protection all around them. And uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be chaos, physical chaos. Um, and and the, the issue about removing him from the White House in case he claims it's um, you know, been rigged, it's a real problem, and, you know. He's going and to he's have... already saying that it's going to it's rigged. I mean, he's already yeah, saying right. if I lose, yeah, it's yeah. rigged. And the, wor well, the worst result of all is if he's able to stay in power. Uh, he's already pulled the wings out of our democracy. I mean, you may disagree about the exact, you know, degree of how much damage he's done, but he's done enormous damage. The Congress is dysfunctional. The Supreme yeah. Court has lost the confidence of the people in many ways. Um, he is running this government as a, as a sole proprietorship. You think it'll be less so in his second term? It'll be more so. And our and democracy and our way of life would be threatened. Don't, don't let me get started. Yeah, and I, we didn't even have time to talk about the religious right and all of this and what that means for America. But real quick question, the Senate. Will the Senate go Democrat or will it remain Republican? Uh, We'll start with Chad. Chad, yeah. Boy, it, it actually does look possible that it's that it could flip. There's a couple of really close. Uh, Susan Collins in Maine. Right. Um, I forget the Arizona center, the woman that was appointed running against the gun violence survivor. Isn't that right, Gabby Gifford's right. husband? And there's a few others. Uh, Hinkenlooper in Colorado. So I I think it I think it's a realistic. Last time I checked the Cook Report and all those others, it was leaning blue. What about you, uh, Colin? I, I agree with Chad. I mean, they they have a shot. 
Um, you know, they're doing way better on the generic ballot, which is usually a, gives you some indication, but Senate, Senate elections can be tough. Um, sometimes people have loyalties to the, the incumbent that, that don't cross the party like in Maine. Um, so I think it's going to, I think the Republicans are going to hold on to it, but um, I, the Democrats have a chance for sure, a solid chance. Jay? For me, uh, I'm not as experienced in these matters as Shatter Colin. For me, it's, it's wishful thinking. It's, uh, you know, from their lips to God's ears. Uh, I sure want to see it flip, but uh, again, I like them. I, I, I can't. We can't. None of us can be sure. No, but you're gonna go with flip, right? Because you're an optimist. Because I'm right. Because when we come back here at the, yeah, at the after November, when we come back here, I want to be able to say, okay, you said. <laughs> so two of you are going to say flip, and one of you won't. Anyway, it's been fun, gentlemen, and I thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show with me and for, uh, for doing this. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and at the minimum, I hope to see you again right after the November election. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you.